Hello, and welcome to the White House. How's everyone doing today? Oh, that does not sound very exciting. You're in the White House, how are you doing? I'm uh, Ava Siegel. I'm the Deputy Director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Uh, I want to welcome you here. We're so excited to have you. Um, Karen and I are filling in big shoes today. Uh, Valerie Jarrett, who is Senior Advisor to President Obama, as well as the Chair of the White House Council on Women and Girls, had an unavoidable conflict and is so sorry that she was not able to be here. So she sends her regards. She says to enjoy the event, and she hopes to see all of you soon. Um, we are really excited for our wonderful panel today. Uh, we have been hosting events throughout Women's History Month uh, to recognize the accomplishments and success and journeys of some remarkable women. The Council on Women and Girls is uh, an, or an initiative that was started by President Obama as one of the first things he did when he came into office. The role of the Council is to make sure that in everything we do, Every program we implement, every policy we uh, design and develop, every piece of legislation we write, we are thinking about the unique needs and experiences of women and girls um, across the federal government at every agency. So we are continuing that today as we look at our role models and look at what we, what we can aspire to be like. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce to you uh, Karen Richardson, who is an Associate Director at the Office of Public Engagement. She heads up our international portfolio and focuses on the role of women around the world, how we empower them, and, and make sure that we are lifting up role models around the world and in the U.S. So with that, I will turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Avra, for that introduction. Filling in for Valerie, uh, great shoes, is quite the undertaking, but I'll do my best. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the White House. We are so delighted to have you here today for this very special event. This event is particularly special to me because it was because of witnessing phenomenal women like these women we have here today that I was inspired to go out and pursue a degree in international affairs. So we have four extraordinary women in, form, in the foreign policy arena um, who have joined us here today to share their experiences. They spent their careers working on behalf of the United States, and their expertise spans the globe. And collectively, I bet they have probably logged more frequent flyer miles than this entire room combined. Our panelists will give you a sense of what it's like to work in national security and foreign affairs so that you can build on your current success, discover your passions, and bring them into the working world. This is one of a series of events celebrating women past and present, as Avra mentioned. All month, we've been hosting students and young people to hear from remarkable women from every walk of life. That's how we've chosen to celebrate Women's History Month this year. Every March, we remember the contributions of women to the country and to the world. We recognize the sacrifices that so many women and men have made in the struggle to achieve equal opportunity for all. And we look ahead to the next generation who will be the leaders and advocates of tomorrow. That's where you all come in. We hope more young women will explore national, national security and foreign policy careers. Women are still underrepresented in foreign, in foreign policy and national security, but we have made progress. The last two decades witnessed three women Secretary of State, for example. But there is still much room to grow and more glass ceilings to crash. The women joining us today know a thing or two about crashing glass ceilings, and they're here to speak candidly to all of you about the rewards and challenges of this field. So without further ado, let me introduce our honor guests for today. First, from your right to left, we have Michelle Flournoy, former Undersecretary for Defense for Policy. In that role, she was the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the formulation of national security and defense policy, oversight of military plans and operations, and in National Security Council deliberations. She also co-founded a think tank, the Center for a New American Security, dedicated to developing national security policy and remains as co-chair on its board of directors. Next, we have Maria Otero, former Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights at the United States State Department. In her position, Maria oversaw U.S. foreign policy issues of democracy and human rights, trafficking, rule of law, crisis prevention and response, global cr criminal justice, countering violent extremism, and much more. She also held the distinction of being the first Latina undersecretary in the history of the State Department. 
Next, we have our very own Caitlin Hayden, spokesperson for the National Security Council here at the White House. Caitlin also spent time at State, focusing on press, speech writing, and South and Central Asia policy. She also has worked as a spokesperson for the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. Next, we have Linda Itam, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Africa at USAID. In this capacity, she oversees the Office of Sudan and South Sudan programs of the Office of West African Affairs. Prior to joining USAID, Etim served as the White House Director for Sudan, South Sudan, and East African Affairs, where she was responsible for coordinating U.S. policy on some of the African continent's most important challenges, including civil military, civil military affairs, governance, economic growth, and humanitarian crises in the Horn of Africa. Finally, we have Nia Malika Henderson. Nia Malika, over here, is a national political reporter for the Washington Post. She has covered both the 2012 and 2008 presidential campaigns and also anchored the Post's widely read election 2012 blog. Before joining the Post, Nia Malika Henderson covered the White House for Politico. Let's give all of our guests here a round of applause. So, without further delay, I hope you have a wonderful discussion. Now I will turn it over to Nia. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I am really, really excited, and I have to admit, a, a little nervous as well. I don't think I've ever uh, had such a conversation in, you know, with George Washington sort of looking down uh, at me. Uh, yes, it feels a little, uh, it's an august occasion and setting. So I just want to jump right in here. Uh, and, and we always hear these conversation uh, now, particularly about women in the workplace uh, and, and the paths they take. I, I want to start with you, Michelle. Uh, I wonder when you were a girl, I mean, was it your dream? I mean, were you like a five-year-old girl thinking that you wanted to work for the Defense uh, Department? How did you end up here? I don't think I had quite that vision at five, but uh, no, I, I think the, the light went on for me um, when I, uh, in high school, had an opportunity to be an exchange student abroad, and I went to uh, Flemish-speaking Belgium for a summer, and you know, suddenly the world opened up, uh, the world of, of foreign countries, foreign cultures. And I think that summer I decided whatever I was going to do, it was going to be in the international domain, and I was going to find some form of public service that was, had an international flavor. OK, OK. Maria? It, mine was quite different, actually. Um, uh, when I was five or seven, I wanted to be a nun. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in Bolivia in La Paz, and the nuns were already recruiting at an early age. But um, I, um, when I went to school, actually in high school, I fell in love with literature. Um, I read Dante's Inferno and decided that I want to be an English professor. So I proceeded to study literature and um, got my master's in um, British Romantic Literature. Uh, and wrote my thesis on John Keats. Have any of you heard, <laughs> read John Keats? So I spent two years researching his work. And it really wasn't until I was entering my doctorate in that that um, there was a huge coup in Chile in 1973 when uh, Pinochet took over um, and, and put in place a dictatorship. And I thought... I'm, I'm from Latin America, why am I studying British Romantic literature? And so it was my first crisis, and I had to shift entirely and move from that work to economics, to political history, to uh, international relations, and then to build the base to then be able to do the work that I'm doing. So um, it was very, very different than what, what I had originally set out to do. <laughs> Caitlin, for you, you're one of the, the younger uh, women on the panel. Is this something you thought about doing when you were in college, in high school? T tell me about your path. Sure. Um, I grew up in a teeny, tiny, small town called Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania, and you, you never really think you're going to go to places like 
Turkmenistan and Bangladesh and or that you're going to end up working at the White House. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was studying communications both in undergrad and, and in graduate school. I got an email uh, from the admissions department about a program called the Presidential Management Internship, which is now called the Presidential Management Fellowship, which I highly recommend to, to everyone. Um, and it gets people into the government uh, kind of at a slightly higher level than entry level, not much higher, but slightly higher, um, and lets you uh, rotate into different positions. And it's a two-year fellowship. And I thought, if I'm doing communications, what's a, what's a product or a thing that I could really believe in and throw myself into and want to work really hard for? And I felt like the government was one of those things. And so I got that email and I applied. Lo and behold, I got through the first first step of the process and the next step and the next step. And then after a giant job fair uh, at the Washington Convention Center, I ended up with a few job offers. And one of them was the State Department. And Secretary Powell was the, uh, was the secretary at the time. And I greatly admired him. And I thought, I've never been anywhere outside the United States. This sounds like a cool thing to do. So I, I took the job. And that was you know in 2001. And I'm still at the State Department since. It's been this amazing ride of kind of uh, opportunity after opportunity to do interesting things. And so I always thought I'd leave after about two or three years, that I'd go do the private sector thing. Right. And I haven't found any good reason to leave. Every opportunity seems like a way to contribute and something that's interesting. So I just keep staying. So 13, 12 <laughs> years on, I'm still here. Um, but that's how, how it happened. So, Linda? So it's, it's, it's probably very similar. Um, I lost both my parents in my last year of high school. And I checked out of school completely and thought, I don't need to go to college. I need to experience life. And my grades dropped to such a point that a lot of my teachers were really nervous about me. I hadn't applied to any colleges. I was just going to work. And I said, skip any of this next steps thing. I can just work, do my life, and not focus on the next steps. And then one of my teachers intervened and said, would you, even if you're not going to college, would you be willing to take this year abroad uh, in Slovakia, of all places. <laughs> sure, and, why not? That's exactly where and, you wanted to go, I'm sure. Exactly, and so I, I took it, not speaking any Slovak, 1990s Slovakia. They had never seen a black person in their life. So it was, it, it was eye-opening. It was a completely different culture. I learned a different language. I experienced some very interesting racism with the skinheads um, in that time. And I realized that I could give back. And to do that, I actually had to go to college. And so that sort of led to the next steps of studying international relations. We're picking back on that uh, idea of being one of a few in, in an environment, Linda being uh, maybe the only uh, African American in that setting. I mean, is that something you have experienced too? You're a Latina, all of you are women. What's it like uh, in, in these environments to be maybe one of a few? Well, probably to, to be serious about the answer, you, um, you feel a certain responsibility um, in addition to being able to just move forward and enjoy the fact that you're bicultural and that you can speak a couple languages and you can interact more broadly with, uh, with groups of people. At the same time, you really are opening a path for Latina women like yourself. And you understand some of the shortcomings and some of the even discrimination that's put in your direction. And so you don't take that lightly. Uh, everything that you do is very much geared towards doing it yourself, but also knowing that there are many Latinas behind you that are not only watching, but for whom you really do become a role model. So to some degree, you watch yourself that way, and you make sure that you are um, um, taking on that responsibility, but also that privilege. I mean, um, when Secretary Clinton found out that I was the first Latina undersecretary at the Department of State, she said, you're kidding. You're kidding. There's never been one. Yeah. So you also see that in many places, we as women, and certainly we as women minorities, are opening up spaces that didn't exist before. And we haven't uh, completed that role. So that, I think, is the other piece that uh, I think is really important to take on. And I'm sure Linda feels pretty much the same way at, uh, at the work that she's doing. 
And Michelle, for you at the Defense Department, I mean, from the outside, it certainly seems like it would be a boys club. Uh, what was your experience like there? Did you feel special responsibility? Were there certain burdens that you might have had to carry uh, because you're a woman? I, I definitely felt that same sense of responsibility of, of wanting to open doors so that others could could follow. But for me, I think the most, the, the really striking experience was my first time in the Pentagon, which was back in the 90s. And I came in, I was a uh, relatively young, female, civilian, political appointee, uh, and a Democrat, which is kind of, you know, <laughs> a lot of strikes against you coming in the door, um, in a very, very male environment where there were very few women in leadership. In fact, we had a leadership lunch in the cafeteria, and we all fit at one table for 10. Uh, and then the, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories afterwards. What were they all meeting and talking about? <laughs> you know? Today, if you invited all the women in the Pentagon, you would overflow the executive dining hall, which is a wonderful you know, uh, sense of progress. But, but I think you know, when you come into an environment where there are very few people who've gone before you who are, look like you or are, you know, have similar traits, um, when the whole culture is very, very different and you are kind of the other, I think the most important thing is when others are underestimating you because of their biases, just to let it be their problem and not to internalize that for yourself. Um, I constantly had uh, situations uh, where I could tell I was being underestimated. Um, I just focused on being as excellent as I could be. Uh, and letting my work speak for itself. And eventually, the ir irony of that is that the underestimation flips, and it's like the talking dog phenomenon. Oh my goodness, isn't she amazing? She actually said something I agree with. She is so <laughs> incredible. Wow, that woman in policy. So, you know, um, I think if you can um, let it be someone else's problem, not let it fluster or upset you or, you know, bring out the too much. A, a degree of anger that sort of clouds your performance. Focus on your performance, focus on delivering, um, and, and, and eventually they will come around. That was certainly my experience. And it gets easier over time as more and more women come into that world and, and start to change the culture, which is something I definitely experienced in the Pentagon this time around. And Caitlin, for you at, at NSC? I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of in awe that I get to be on this panel. I mean, under sec in my mind, <laughs> Undersecretary yeah. Otero and Undersecretary Flournoy uh, are the women that I watch at the policy table, you know, yeah. making policy. And I get to sit in the row right behind them. And I feel like uh, the women of their generation and, and they have, have made it such that uh, I have less kind of insecurity about whether people think I'm going to be qualified or not. Um, and I, I do spend a lot of time, and particularly in my, in my early 20s when I started at the State Department, trying to make sure that I did a job uh, as well as I could so that no one could ever question why I was there. Was it because I was young or because I like, wore short skirts? Or, you know, I wanted to make sure that people knew I did a good job, I was smart, I was there because I knew what I was doing. And I do feel like um, that pressure I felt in my 20s, I, I don't feel as much now, and that's partly from... from being a little bit older and having been around a little bit longer, but also, you know, working with these other women who have set this standard that, yeah, I, I'm there because, you know, women can do this and, and I know what I'm doing. And so it's, it's been really amazing to, to watch these, you know, high-level interagency meetings and see the women at the table, you know, discussing what are, what are these you know, difficult issues, counterterrorism, things like that, with, with their male counterparts. And it's, it's, it's fantastic. And, um, I've just really benefited from watching people be confident and do that and think, okay, I can do that. I, I can have my stuff together and, yeah. and make interventions like that. Yeah. Linda, I, I want you to talk about your experience. And two, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, uh, have, have you been able to find folks in, in your field, mentoring relationships, women who've come up before you, and is that something that you found helpful and useful? And if so, how are you able to do that? So I, I think that I've, I've been very lucky in finding a, a, a lot of women in our field um, that have been willing to sort of reach their arms out, especially in international affairs. I think even though there are a lot of, there are, there, there are a lot more women, I think, than there were before, and even though you can see a lot of people, um, I think that there's still an understanding that a lot of the top positions are still male-dominated, and I think that when, again, like the talking dog example, 
when, you, when you're working really hard, and as women, we tend to work really hard to prove that we can do as good of a job, um, that there are a few people that will recognize that. And I found that you know, there's, there's just this quiet, especially in government, respect for systems and people who know how to make things work. Um, and I, I've had a really uh, a good experience with uh, people recognizing the quietness because I haven't had to be very aggressive in, in these jobs. Um, I'm a pretty shy person, actually. People don't really believe that. But um, and I've I've had the opportunity to actually be able to have them say, you know, this is what our recommendations for you to get to that next step would be. Um, when I was in DoD, especially, I think that people took that very seriously in those environments that are usually male dominated. So these jobs are incredibly tough, incredibly time consuming. Uh, Michelle, I, I read an article uh, about your decision to leave the Defense Department and, and you expressed a desire to spend more time with your family and it wasn't a euphemism uh, when you said it, it was a reality. Uh, can you talk about that, balancing uh, work life with home life? Uh, so many conversations people are having about can women have it all, what does it mean to have it all? What's your take on that? Well, I consider myself incredibly um, fortunate and blessed in that I uh, have three beautiful children, um, two of whom are now teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and also a very fulfilling and exciting um, career. Uh, and But my career's been sort of a sign curve, um, where there have been periods of great professional intensity where, truthfully, I was asking my family to sacrifice to support that. Um, and then periods where I rebalance to spend, to be more available to my kids and so forth. But I have been very fortunate in the sense that I have never had that um, rebalancing affect the overall trajectory or arc of my career. I've been able to step in and out and modulate that as, as needed. And I, I know there are so many women who don't have that luxury and society doesn't support right. them in doing that. So I want to acknowledge that I'm very, very fortunate to even have, be in this position. But I think, um, you know, I thought it was a very tough decision to leave um, the administration when I did. I am a huge supporter of this president, and it was very hard to, to step away from that. But my husband's also serving. He's the deputy secretary at the VA, and we literally did this very wonky matrix of, you know, sitting down, what could he achieve in the last year, what could I achieve in the last year? Um, knowing that our, now that our kids were becoming teenagers, they needed a little bit more parental time than they were getting from two political appointees serving in senior positions in the administration. Somebody needed to be a, around a little bit more. And we came to a collective decision that it made sense. Um, but I worried about it. Um, my hope was that I would demonstrate for other women who are trying to find that balance that you can step in and you can step out and you can step in again. Um, uh, it matters what you do with the time in between to keep yourself competitive and viable and to keep learning and growing and contributing in other ways. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think it is a very personal set of decisions that families make together. Um, having a supportive uh, full partner in that process is critical. Having saints for children who understand <laughs> when you're working 24-7 for administration is critical. But it, it can be done. I, I would say you can have it all. You can't always have it exactly at the same moment. Uh, Mar Maria, what about for you? I know you have three adult three children. Kids. So yeah, but they're a little one time. Yeah. <laughs> um, there. Um, at one time, I had three kids under five, and I remember um, arriving at work Monday morning, and people would say, well, "How was your weekend?" And I'd say, "Exhausting. <laughs> I'm delighted to be back at work." Right. <laughs> But um, so, you know, I think I, I would probably echo some of the things that Michelle has said. I would put forefront the enormous importance of having uh, a partner that uh, shares the parental responsibilities and with whom you can just interact completely in, in this area. A second one, I think, is letting your kids know that mom works and that mom works not only because she is out pursuing her own career, but she's working in order for them to be able to have full lives themselves. Uh, at one point when I traveled a lot and they were teenagers, um, I sat them down and I just said, listen guys, you're gonna suffer because mom's traveling, um, 
So I'm going to start a fund for each of you, and it's going to be for the therapy you're going to need because your mom is traveling. <laughs> That's great. So I'm just going to put some money into there. And then <laughs> if you need more, it's on your nickel. But <laughs> the issue was taking some of these issues that are realities and and weighing them less, you know, and bringing everybody into into the picture so that it is very much a family um, a family decision and a family affair. There are some things you can't do, I think, or you have to decide whether you do or not. Uh, I would have found very, very difficult to be able to commute, you know, and to leave my family all week and then just to be home for two days. I think that would have been very hard. So you, you need to make sure it's a variety of the stepping back or not, uh, or, uh, um, or just moving full force ahead. But um, the final thing that I would say about trying to do it all is that I did my curriculum vita because I'm now not in government anymore, and it's three pages. <laughs> wow. And the last two words in those three pages are the ones that matter to me the most, and they say three children. Wow. So I, th and I think that's important also for each person to be able to decide, is, um, and, and it's a personal decision the role that family or children will play in your lives. It's an entirely personal decision. But once that becomes part of uh, what you want to do, then, then you need to use humor and you need to new, use your energy and use um, humility to be able to really um, just move it forward. It's completely doable yeah. from that regard. Uh, uh Caitlin, not to delve too much into your personal life, but I, I know you don't have kids now. Uh, your boyfriend might be out there somewhere. I know he, he'll be he, maybe. watching the video. Later, he'll be watching so. the video. Um, but you, you're at, at at a stage where you're probably thinking about these things and what you want to do uh, in terms of a family, in terms yeah. of a, you know the work life balance. Uh, I am. <laughs> no, I I blurted it out when we were in the in the other room. Um, yeah. yeah, I I do not have kids yet. I would very much like to have them um, in the future. Uh, I'm almost 35, so that means it's probably time to start thinking about that. Um, for me, I, I think family is the, is the absolute most important thing in life, uh, but I, I made a conscious decision to keep saying yes to these jobs that meant you know, they would wreck my weekends and wreck my social life and put me on airplanes you know, for weeks at a time because I, for me personally, I wanted to see what I could achieve and not have any regrets when it's time to do that, that I didn't take this opportunity or that I didn't go to Afghanistan or that I didn't try that. I didn't want to look back and say I didn't try it because I chose something else. So um, I'm, I'm kind of peaking, like I'm at my dream job now. So um, I feel like I can, whatever time is the right time to start a family, I'll feel like I can walk away from this having gotten so much more out of it than, I, than I'd planned. So I'm, I, you know, fingers crossed, I'm hoping this works out for me, but I, I'm very much a believer in, in what Michelle said about um, you can probably have it all, but maybe not all at the same time. And right. These jobs, even though I don't have kids, have shown you know, me the, the, how much work and effort it takes to, to do something like this and maintain a family. My, my poor parents, my brother, my friends are constantly getting short shrift as I pull out my Blackberry that's here in my pocket and say, hold on, I have to skip brunch to do this or I have to run to the office. And whether it's kids or friends or, you know, anything, you, you kind of have to decide where you want to put your, put your effort and put your time. And it all depends what matters to you then. And so I've put the effort into my career, but I'm, I'm excited about kind of maybe putting less into that uh, a couple years from now and, and putting more time into to family and relationships. So. Yeah. Linda, what about for you? I have noticed, you know, when you go out in this town of Washington and you go out with your girlfriends or your, or your friends, the, the conversation inevitably goes back to work and in politics. And it's like, can't we get a break and, and just, you know, have a beer? Um, I mean, what sort of a relationship have you been able or balance have you been able to strike uh, in terms of that work life and, and having some fun? So I would say that I'm not sure if I'm there yet. <laughs> right. um, but, I, but I also would say, you know, pick a job also if you become the obsessive compulsive person for your job like I am. Pick a job that you love. Um, pick a job that gets you into fields and gets you into I issues that you would do regardless of if you were being paid for them. And so I, I'm very lucky in that we talk about work, but what we've tried to do consciously is not talk about the office politics, 
but talk about the issues that we care about. So our rule when we go out is to sort of talk about the issues, to talk about the subject matter, and to sort of maintain that love of discussion on those issues rather than just talking about, well, this person did this, and you know all the other wonky stuff that you can sort of uh, get into. And I think that as long as I, as long as I love what I do, and as long as I, it, those are my interests, I think it's it's probably okay to be as uh, obsessed and, and immersed in, in work. Um, I did make an effort after I left the NS, NSC uh, to try and re re-engage in my hobbies. So I have, I have my welcome to Linda part two post NSC life, and so I, I think that I make an effort every weekend also to consciously do different things uh, that are sort of on a nice little checklist, and that helps too. Yeah. Maria, what do you know now uh, that you wish uh, that you knew when you were 18 or 25? I think back to those ages, and I remember just being so nervous about the future and would everything work out? Um, and I wish I could tell myself back then, everything will work out. I mean, what do you, what, what sort of advice do you have uh, in terms of what you know now and, and you wish you'd known then when you were 18 or 25 and thinking about uh, the life ahead of you? Well, certainly when I was 18, even 25, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted and I knew exactly the path that my life was going to take um, and that I was going to be the one determining that path. And um, if I had known at the time um, that this issue of kind of tracking out your career into the future was going to be what was going to happen, um, th that's probably lesson number one. You just don't know what will come in your direction, uh, and you don't know what shape it will come in. Uh, you will network your heart out, and then your best friend, who you didn't network at all, will be the person that will give you the next lead. And so your life is affected by the people around you, and you have to allow that to happen. Um, it caused a um, huge identity crisis for me in my 20s as I had to say goodbye to a profession that I really loved and move to one where I had no training yet and start anew. Um, but I think that idea that uh, you have to believe and just trust uh, in yourself and, and move it forward, I think, is important. Um, I don't know that um, the, the notion of um, doing, you, one of the things that I think is also important is early on in your 20s, you are learning. Uh, you are developing yourself. You are defining your values. You're defining who you're going to be as a professional and, how, and what characteristics about yourself you want to manifest in most of your interactions or in most of your exchanges or most of your decisions and actions. So um, I think at 18, I would have, had I understood better uh, the importance of spending part of the next 10 years formulating who you are going to become because if you don't do that, somebody else will do it for you. Uh, and you won't be able to really understand the, the very fundamental reasons as to why you're doing what you do. Um, and once you have that understood, it's actually a little bit less important what it is exactly. It can take what it is that you do. It can take a variety of different paths. So I think some of, some of these would have been... Uh, the lessons that I would have yeah, figure out who out. you yeah. are, yeah. what you want. Uh, Michelle, what about for you? I, I would totally echo what you just said. Uh, a couple of uh, additional things. One is, um, I think the role of mentors and sponsors can be critical. I, when I first moved down to Washington, I moved down in the Clinton administration for a job that ended up going, um, they, the person doing the hiring had promised the job to a, a few people. Uh, and I only discovered that after I'd moved here, uprooted my life, brought my, you know, it was a mess. But at that, it was a critical, sort of a crisis moment in my career where someone said, you know, choose the boss, not the job. It's like so many of you have been told for school, choose the professor, not the course. Find a boss who's really going to invest in you, mentor you, grow you, test you, develop you. And I ended up uh, making uh, my choice to come into government based on that 
I was terrified of the subject matter because it was completely outside my comfort zone and the learning curve was like Mount Everest, but I was choosing the boss. And I tell you, it was the best decision I ever made. That person became a lifelong mentor, promoter, sponsor, is responsible for multiple opportunities I've had since. So I think that is, that is something um, that's really important. The other thing I would say, for those of you who are thinking about government service as a political appointee, even if you're wildly successful, uh, and your party is wildly successful, um, you're likely to still, over the course of a career, spend more time outside government than in. So it's very important to have something else that you're passionate about. What is that outside base that you feel you're still serving, you're still contributing, you're still really excited when you get up in the morning and go to work, and that's going to keep you um, contributing uh, in the in-between the in government service periods. I think, for me, that's the world of ideas and think tanks and contributing to the kind of intellectual capital of national security, if you will. But it, you gotta find out what that is because I think there, that, that um, you, you don't, uh, too many people, I think, sort of spend a lot of time waiting for that time of government service and it may or may not come. It is, it is um, and so you gotta find those other ways to contribute um, in between and that build your intellectual capital to bring into government to make the maximum contribution when you do have the opportunity. Caitlin, what about for you? What sort of advice uh, do you have? Well, if I could give myself any advice, I would give their advice back to my 18-year-old <laughs> my self. Um, but yeah, I think it's this idea that um, it's good to plan and good to, to kind of know where you want to go, but even more important to figure out who you are and to pursue those things that make you happy. Um, I, all the jobs I've done were, none of them were the things that I thought I would do. Um, they're so totally different, and they've been so much better than what I would have planned for myself when I was 18. Um, and being able to look at, at something and, and take a different direction, to take an opportunity you weren't expecting and go with it um, and learn from it. And, and just the other advice I would have given myself is just that um, you learn from everything. Even if you take a job that is no fun, you don't like it, you're, you know, you learn from that. My first job uh, at the State Department, I did not really enjoy. I did not kind of like the, the atmosphere. I felt like I wasn't being used. But what I got out of that was the benefit of a good boss, actually. And so I now am so grateful for every good boss that I've had because right. I know what it's like to work in an office where you're not necessarily being taken seriously or being utilized. And so even though that was a really terrible sort of six or seven months, I learned from it and it has you know, kept with me the whole time. So I think just knowing that you may have things that you think are mistakes or bad experiences along the way, but actually they're not all bad. You, you do take a lot from them and they help you in the next few steps. So things that don't go so well are kind of okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe not at the time, but they, they will be. And Linda, you definitely took that advice of, of trying something new and different in going to Slovakia. Um, what other advice would you impart uh, to these folks as they're trying to make their way? Uh, all the same advice that you just heard. I mean, it's excellent advice. And also just to uh, make sure that you are open um, to every experience that comes out. Um, I, I think that the idea of knowing where you're going to go, you'll agonize, you'll agonize, and it's never going to turn out the way that you think it is, but that you, you can take something, again, like Caitlin was just saying, you can take something out of every experience. And I think the worst experiences that I've had uh, have actually been the things that have prepared me for the next levels uh, that I've gone to after that, because you become, you learn skill sets and you learn tools, you learn how to deal with bad bosses, you learn how to deal with difficult people, um, and those are invaluable um, because if you don't have those skill sets, you're not ready then for those next levels. So I, I almost say if, you, if you've had nothing but positive experiences, then when the, by the time you get to that negative experience, you're going to be completely unprepared. And so use each one of these sort of stepping stone positions uh, to, to develop and learn and grow. And it's also a good thing to tell yourself when you're going through it, this is for something. I'm going to be a great person in the future. <laughs> <laughs> So, Caitlin, I want to ask you this. So, if I'm in college right now, or, am I, or I'm in grad school, are there certain courses I should be taking? Are there magazines I should be reading if I want to go into this uh, field and, and, and foreign service and policy? I'm, I, I mean, I, I think that 
the, there's no specific uh, course or I think uh, or magazine that that will absolutely prepare you for what you're going to do. I think the field of foreign affairs uh, is widening. Um, and I think that there are so many different areas that you'll be able to go into that we can't even sort of think about right now. But I will say um, that, you know, there's some basic core ones, languages, languages, languages. Um, the more you speak, the more you know, the more you'll be able to communicate and the more you'll be able to read and the more you'll be able to understand. So I, I think the best decision that I made was I like to, I like to learn languages, uh, learning as many as possible, because it's harder once you get into the job. Uh, the, the, once you start working, you're not going to have the time or the patience to learn them well. So you might be able to speak a little bit later, but you know, this is the time to focus on actually learning them as well as you can and picking up quantity as well. I feel like there was some study that said at some point your brain just shuts off and you can't learn anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I am, I think. Um, Maria, you speak four languages? Yeah. How did you, I mean, like, how did you do that? I'm remembering, well, I didn't speak English. Okay. I used to okay. speak <laughs> Spanish, and learning English was really hard. But I learned it right at a time where I could pick it up fully. But Portuguese, uh, I was about to um, finish grad school in international edu uh, economics, and I was working as an intern looking for to stay there full time. So I went up to my boss, wonderful man, and I said, I'm just trying to see if I can work here um, after being an intern. And he looked at me and he said, how's your Portuguese? And I said, fluent, why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where that came from because I spoke a tiny little bit. But um, <laughs> it's awesome. That's so great. <laughs> and and he said, you know, he said, well, I just want to know what options I have. So I just left that room and just started going to school at night, <laughs> <laughs> studying and studying and studying, until I could. It's not if you have Spanish, it makes it easier. So right. But I actually really just busted myself to try to get it to the level. And then ended up working in Brazil. Yeah. Um, and, and then it, my, my Portuguese became fluent. But, um, <laughs> you know, this, this notion about lean in that we yeah. keep hearing about, right. lean in. Yeah. Just lean in. Um, and, uh, and be able to just uh, take some of those things and move them forward. But, you know, I think, I, I mean, I agree with Lynn on the, on the issue of uh, languages. But the other piece is get out of the United States. Tra not just travel overseas, find ways in which, whether it's Peace Corps, whether it's uh, a one year, um, um, one year abroad to a country that you couldn't find on a map, you know, before you went there. This will really turn you into the global citizen that I believe you need to be as you look to represent the United States overseas. And if you don't use this time, even if you're not earning any money, even if your parents are going to have to support you, whatever the reason, uh, I would say find uh, those six months, that year, that even longer, to be able to live outside of your comfort zone and to understand how other people in other cultures live. For me, that is one of the biggest lessons, and then being able to take that in and use it in the work that you're doing. Um, I did that several times in my life. And, I, and the last time that I did that, when I moved to Honduras with two children and with, um, um, and with my husband, I probably took a salary cut of about 50%. But for me, it was so important to work in the field, to be able to understand how it is that you can get things done in developing countries, in countries that are so difficult, where the adversities are so great, that we as foreign policy um, representatives don't understand at all if we haven't really tried to live there. So that, for me, is part of the overall education that will also help you determine who you are, um, yeah. in any case. So I think we're going to try to open it up uh, to, to questions. Do you guys have any? I hope you have questions. You look so bright and full of questions. <laughs> I 
Are these on already? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like it's on. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much um, to all of the panelists for being here with us today. Um, I really do appreciate all of your comments, and I know all of the women uh, here today do as well. Um, my name is Elena Kim. Uh, I served in the Army for five years, and now I'm a student at the George Washington University. Um, I was actually invited today um, with some of my sorority sisters from Delta Phi Epsilon. We're a professional foreign service sorority. Um, so I have a lot of questions for you guys, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it um, really short. Um, so one of the first questions that I have um, is regarding the paths that you um, took to get where you are today. And you've already talked to us about um, how that path sort of changed from one stage in your life to the next. Um, there's a lot of talk now um, with the book Lean In about the concept of a jungle gym as opposed to a linear career path. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to sort of um, get your comments on is um, do you think that women stay away or are drifting away from the concept of a linear career path because it's not realistic in our work environment today or because um, young women in particular uh, lack the sort of self-confidence to say this is my end goal, this is where I want to be and I'm going to get there no matter what. Um, and I, I'd be happy to hear comments from any of the panelists. Thank you. Michelle, you want to take that? Sure. I, I personally really like the notion of a jungle gym as opposed to a ladder because it's much more, it's a better metaphor for my own experience where sometimes I felt I was moving sideways or diagonally, but I was still able to go back and get to uh, a goal down the line. So, um, you know, I think the, the debate that's been sparked, a healthy debate, I think, by particularly Sheryl Sandberg's book, Leaning In, or Lean In, um, you know, I think that there are elements of perhaps um, self-regulation uh, or uh, censorship that do go on sometime for some women um, and all kinds of survey data suggests that women question their own abilities more to go for uh, jobs often than their male counterparts. They will question more how it fits in with the rest of life and so forth. But um, again, recognizing that Cheryl was speaking to a very particular slice of women who are fortunate to have these choices, I do think the notion of leaning in is important, and, and I think we've talked about that a little bit today. The idea of while you are uh, focused on your professional life, going for it and not self-censoring, not holding back in anticipation, I think part of the reason why I know I had choices after the first time that I did take time out for family, um, or at least I always worked, but le I was in a less intense job, was that I had leaned in before that and gotten to a certain level. I had reached the sort of deputy assistant secretary level before I started my family, and that fact gave me many more options to move sideways, you know, diagonally, to move across the jungle gym, knowing that when I was ready, I could come back and try to go for that next level up. Um, so I think it's, it's having the confidence to to know that there is no straight line. There are lots of different co career paths to get to the same sort of destinations. I think the most important thing that Anne-Marie Slaughter's article pointed out and Cheryl's book points out is that we as a society need to do a better job of supporting those multiple paths. There is no one size fits all, particularly for women and for men who are trying to be active, involved uh, parents at various phases in their lives. Do you, you want to talk no, about that? What's your question? Hi, my name is Julian Lewis. I'm a freshman political science major from New Orleans, and I attend Howard University. I want to thank y'all for coming. Um, first thing I say, Tim, my parents didn't pass away, but my mother got PTSD when I was a junior. And so I did like you did, and I was just like, I'm not going to go to school. I'm not going to do any of these things. But then I also did a bunch of stuff. I studied abroad in Argentina. And that made me realize that I wanted to do service, that I wanted to help you know, the community and my own people shy away from, I always wanted to do law. I was like, I'm gonna make all this money, I'm gonna do all this stuff. And then going abroad and really seeing 
I want to work with children. I want to be a child advocacy lawyer. And I volunteered at this orphanage. And I got to see the struggle of actual people, you know? You think you struggle. And I thought I was struggling because my parents run around. But to see how people lived in other places really gave me perspective. And so I want to thank you all for, you know, inspiring all the women in this room. My question is, how do you become comfortable when you don't do what's right? You know how you, you go through this jungle dam when you realize this is not what I wanted to do. I've messed up. How do you get comfortable in that? And how do you not bury yourself and be like so ashamed of yourself, you know? Hmm. M Maria, you want to take that or? You know, that's hard. Um, and sometimes the, the, the shaming and the humiliation can come from others that can, you know, put it on your shoulders. Um, and as was mentioned before, these can be moments where you can learn a lot from. I was dismissed from a job after working for five years in the organization and doing a good job, but there were managerial concerns and issues completely separate from me, but I was actually asked to leave the organization. And um, you're, you're, you go down pretty deep, you know, when that happens. I hid myself and I used to do a lot of photography back there, so I hid myself in my dark room for about three weeks, you know, before I came out again. But I think the, the, the idea is that, you, and I, you know, I used this word humility before because, you know, expect that sometimes you're not going to be excellent and that you're not going to be uh, a shining star and allow yourself uh, that situation and allow yourself to be able to learn from it. Um, and, and generally, uh, you know, I think w one of the things that I found in my, in my work and in my career was one of the things I had the hardest time with was just confronting, confronting others when they did something that I thought had to be different or confronting really myself in, in a situation of this sort. So this idea of being able to um, use confrontation in a positive way is, uh, uh, is also something that I would say is a skill that can also help you move from that step to another one. The learning that you gain from that, which uh, Caitlin talked about, is enormous. If you're, you know, if you're just a shining star and nothing ever goes wrong, um, you better look both ways and see why that's happening. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just accept that about it and, and, and move forward. Thank what you. about for you? Hi, uh, my name is Rhonda Carter. I've served the administration for the last four years, first in the White House and now at the Department of Energy. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I feel like I've learned a lot just from hearing y'all talk about your experiences and, and uh, take much of your advice to, to heart. Um, I wanted to ask about mentors or finding mentors because unless one is divinely wrought, right, you, you, you take this job and you find out your boss is the best and cares about, is very invested in you and that kind of thing. Um, you, you know, you walked in situation you don't necessarily know where these mentors are going to come from so if you know you didn't have the magical you know awesome professor the magical first boss um, who, who plucks you out from from the masses um, how would you go about trying to develop relationships with people who you identify as potential mentors um, if you're looking for somebody um, to give you guidance yeah this is a great uh, a great question Caitlin you want to take this one uh, I will. I will do my best. I I actually lucked out and had one of the best bosses ever uh, in one of my just first lucky jobs. Also, so, um, no. Who who was great about that? Um, so if you find one of those people, hold on to them. And in fact, I worked for him for six years, and he has continues to be a mentor who advises me from you know from afar. So number one, if you meet somebody, you know, even if you move jobs, hold on to them. Um, there are places, including the White House, that have uh, actual uh, formal mentorship programs, and that pairs someone who wants a mentor with someone who wants to be a mentor, and I think wanting to be a mentor is really important. Right. You can't um, kind of glom onto people uh, who don't want to provide you that. <laughs> right. It takes a lot of, no, it, it takes a lot of effort to, to kind of mentor someone, and there are people willing to do that, um, but if they don't want to do that, don't be upset, don't 
don't, it's not personal. It's something they, they've decided about whether they want to do or not. And I think, you know, your friends, their bosses, your you know, networking, their sort of professional uh, societies, their alumni associations, I think wherever you can find someone that inspires you, frankly, whether that person is in your field or not in your field, just someone who has successfully managed all these transitions, uh, because whether you're in government or out, there's, there's a, a great amount of uh, consistency about how to, to get along in a workplace, how to make decisions in your life. Um, that I think you can find in lots of unexpected places. Um, I, I don't know if there's a better, is there a better answer yeah. about how you do that? Because yeah. I you, Do you want to say something, Maria? Were you just lucky or did you have to go out finding folks or what was your experience like, Maria? Well, I believe that um, you can be mentored by just about any situation that you are in. Choose to find mentoring everywhere. I mean, part of it is how you look at it. You can schedule it and say it's going to be my boss and my boss is going to inspire me and my boss is going to wow me and my boss is somehow going to awaken in me things that I don't have. I've been to refugee camps where I've talked to the women who traveled from Syria into that refugee camp or from Somalia into that refugee camp and, um, and what they went through, what uh, they... Um, communicated to me became a kind of mentoring experience for me as well. So it taught me, allow yourself to be mentored even by people who you might think don't have that capacity. So it's, it's a little bit oh, looking great. at these things differently than just, all right, I want you and you and you to be yeah. my mentors because you all look so, uh, so successful. Yeah, I mean, great. you know, you really find a lot of uh, mentoring capabilities in people that, uh, Cross your lives in other ways, yeah. and I think uh, I would sort of awaken you to to use those opportunities. Linda, did you want to add something to that, or well, I was I was going to say something similar, but I, yeah. I I also just wanted to say that um, mentoring, you know, people like to talk about themselves, and <laughs> and, and and so you know, if you're not looking at it as a transactional relationship, and you really go into sort of conversations, you know, meet people go and talk to people. And as a shy person, I'm not saying that lightly. Um, and you'll find people who you just will connect with. The more conversations you have with people, the more people are potentially willing to open up and have those conversations with you. And when you meet somebody that you're comfortable with, continue to have those conversations. There are a lot of people that uh, didn't, weren't in my field to begin with that I had conversations with that I had relationships with and have become mentors over time just because of the positions and things that they've moved into. And you, you can't always just sort of, as you said, define it on paper. Yeah. And I, now with like social media, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on Twitter, it's much easier to you know, make connections with people who aren't in your office or in your, in your college. So you have a question. Hello, my name is Yasmin Serrato. I'm a senior at Georgetown studying science, technology, international affairs. It is one major. Um, my question is for Mr. Otero. Um, as a woman, we, we, we heard you talk about challenges in the workforce. I'm interested in hearing challenges in the cultural background, especially as someone who's looking to go into Latin America and a fellow Latina. There are certain cultural barriers and stereotypes that tend to hold women back. So I'm wondering how you handle those if you face them. No, I know exactly what you're talking about. If you're working in a Latino environment, um, it is not easy, especially if you are in a field that is male dominated, and certainly science and technology is that many, t I worked a lot in Latin America, um, and there were many times when I was the only woman in the room, um, and dealing with the machismo and with the, the sort of uh, um, sexism, you know, that you would get. The, uh, part of the way that I dealt with it was uh, uh, actually ignoring most of it. You know, just just ignoring it, uh, and um, and playing out what I call our own female advantages. I mean, we as managers, as women professional, as women, have some advantages that we can uh, certainly use and put on the table. Uh, we can communicate very well. We I think have a level of sensitivity that works in our. Uh, we can nurture effectively. We can be, at, at times, even uh, friendlier in, in moving things forward. And I just use some of those to be able to deal with a situation. 
but you have to combine them with this other um, role of confronting um, when you are either being played down or when um, you are, uh, sh you know, shunned aside for not being able to carry out something. You have to be able to take to look at that person in the eye and articulate uh, the reasons why this shouldn't be happening. Um, and so some combination of those two have, have worked well with me and I've been able to uh, work very well. There's also, just a final thing, there's also a lot of really lovely men out there. You know, I mean, this isn't, I, I don't think we want right. to play, uh, uh, especially now, boy, if you went back a couple of generations ago, I did have men, Latino men say to me, ah, um, Gosh, I didn't know you're pretty, but I didn't know you were going to be intelligent too. I mean, I've had people say that to me. That doesn't happen quite so much. Any, it doesn't happen anymore. But there are also men that can be very helpful in those kinds of settings, and that can uh, understand some of these dimensions and and and, and help provide some uh, some support as well. Yeah. What's your question? And, th and thanks for your question. Hi, I'm Megan Schmink. Um, I'm a senior at American University here, and I've just felt so lucky to be in the city and be able to have access to so many internships and that kind of is like a built-in networking system but now I'm thinking about uh, leaving the DC area for law school and I still want to make sure I stay connected um, to everything because I am really passionate about you know policy and and international affairs and I was wondering if you guys had tips especially as women how to network when you're in Washington when you're outside of Washington um, yeah any tips would be welcome Caitlin, you want to talk about that a little bit? I would just, again, um, find those people that you, as Linda said, have connected with and hold on to them. Um, send them an email whenever you're in town, ask to have coffee, you know, whenever's convenient for them, but just make sure that you kind of keep that connection, the occasional email, whenever you're gonna be in town, giving them plenty of notice to say, hey, I'd really like to, to stay connected. Um, and if you keep a few of those, um, I think you'll be in a really good spot because usually we can, uh, when folks come to me, I'll say, well, you know, I don't actually know that much about this, but I have this friend who works in that office right. and I'll connect you and you should go talk to them. Um, so if you, if you have those few links in, in the areas you're interested, they can always help you network elsewhere, but it's, it's just a quick coffee. I find usually catches you up on sort of several months worth of what's been going on. Cause DC, uh, you know, it, it's, um, there's always a lot of a lot of stuff going on, but the the institutions don't wildly change. Usually, if you knew what office you were working in at one point, you know, a few months later, it'll still be kind of the same. So just keep those links, um, yeah. email, phone calls, but coffee, a quick coffee, you know, every few months should probably do it when you're on spring break or whatever else. Yeah, I think that's right. And that whole idea of asking people, who else should I talk to? I mean, I do that with sources all the time. Can you give me, you know, some names of other people I should talk to for a story? So I think that's a great, a great idea. Thanks for your question. What's your question? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Stevens, and I'm a senior, uh, going to be graduating in May from George Washington University. I'm a Middle East Studies major, but when people ask me what I want to do after I graduate or what I want to be, all I can say is I want to be abroad. <laughs> and I really have no direction here and have been applying for jobs in Rwanda, uh, Palestine, Switzerland, Estonia. Slovakia um, as well? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and really my main question is, um, do you think it's more important to have a regional ex a regional expertise or I mean I know you Linda were in Slovakia and are now the head of the Africa division of USAID so um, it, is it better to just have international experience or a focus or, or just take any opportunity that comes my way? Yeah, Linda. Well, I'll, I'll also defer to some of the other panelists, but I, I think that you can have both. I, th I think just get abroad. I think that's the greatest advice ever. As you mentioned, I, I studied abroad in Slovakia, then I got hooked on it, so I went to Brazil, and then I went to France, and as you mentioned, I'm now doing Africa. Um, I, I think that there's there's always opportunities uh, to to go and focus later, and that the skill set that you learn from going abroad will will still serve you well uh, in whatever you plan on doing. I, I did end up focusing afterward. I, I'd say so. I think that there's there's a there's room for becoming a specialist, and that there's a lot of value. And you know, I love working on Africa and East Africa in specific. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on, uh, I think that you, you get valued for expertise as well and that there's, there are different paths that you can take, um, but you know, it, it, you have time, I think, to, to do that. 
Thanks for your question. I think we just have time for one more. Um, so uh, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Natasha McKenzie, and I'm a student at Trinity Washington University, and I'm studying political science. Uh, my question pertains to ageism. Um, oftentimes we have really great experience, um, but we might get overlooked because of how young we are. So what are some key ways to um, overcome that obstacle? Ageism, uh, meaning they feel like maybe they're too young and they'll be overlooked uh, at this point, and maybe on the opposite end of that would be if you're, yeah, well, you're talking the other end, right? Um, who wants to take that? Maybe you want to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, a few things. You you have to do your you have to do your homework. Um, I think when you're younger and you don't have you don't have a record for people to look back at to say, oh, they've successfully accomplished these five things, is to show that you can that you want to, that you're willing to put in the work, no matter the hour, no matter what it takes, uh, to not be the person who says, I, I shouldn't do that, it's not in my lane. Say, you need help? Okay, great, I'm in. Like, being a good teammate, always be willing to, to put in the work. Um, and do your homework, and you know, when you have your moment to shine, you know, nail it. Um, so I think that's all you can do is over time, uh, even though you're young, be the person that raises your hand and says, I'm, I'm happy to help. And then, and then really deliver and make yourself kind of uh, indispensable uh, and show that you can, you can really deliver. And once you do that over a certain amount of time, you're no longer the person with no experience. You're the person they, that this office or that official had a really good experience with and, and will tap again. Yeah. Michelle? And I think you can, you can build a resume based on you know, life experiences that show certain qualities and skill sets and so forth until you kind of have a critical mass of work ex experience. But I was going to say the other thing is just persistence and tenacity. I mean, I started my career actually as a journalist, and my first job was as a stringer for Time Magazine when I was in college. But to get that job, I literally uh, spent my entire spring break, it started on Monday, every day trying to get in to see the bureau chief of the bureau where I was trying to get signed up. And every day I was told, no, he doesn't have time, we don't have any spaces. Just, you know, it wasn't, a, I was a nice pest. Um, <laughs> but I just kept persisting and persisting. And by Friday, I had such wonderful long conversations with his secretary for the five days. <laughs> and finally, out of pity, she said, okay, well, I'll find you five minutes. Just come and wait in the waiting room, and when he's walking out the door, we'll get you five minutes. And it got me in the door yeah. to be able to, to, to make my case to this editor who had no business hiring me and just to give me a shot. But I think the sort of persistence and tenacity, and if you really, really want something, just not not taking no for an answer and keep at it and keep finding a way to try to get to your goal. Maria? That, that's a great story. <laughs> um, but one final thing, I think Kaylin has really hit on a really important point, which is as you move forward in your careers, keep thinking that um, the way you relate to people around you, um, the way you interact, the way in which you think of their success, much as the way as you think of, think of your own, is probably the most important advice that I could give you. Uh, and I didn't, want, I didn't want to leave that unsaid because that is what's going to enable you to move forward. The minute you think that this path is only about you, you will lose it all because uh, you will find that in order to aggrandize yourself, you will belittle others or you will diminish their value. And when that, when that begins to happen, um, you will really not get anywhere. And I think what Caitlin is saying, regardless of age, and especially when you're younger, this idea of being collaborative and helping others also excel is something that will help you enormously. Yeah. Um, and then by the time you get to the positions that we're in, you are then happy to hire people that are smarter than you are, right. uh, that are sharper than you are, and who will really take the work, move it forward, and make you look good, right? Yeah. yeah. 
But anyway, this is what I yeah. think is really important. I think that's right. And I think today, for all of you here, uh, is a great way, uh, a great opportunity to network with each other. I don't think you don't know everyone in this room. You're from different schools. Exchange cards, because you guys are going to be uh, in these jobs 10, 15, 20 years from now. So start getting to know uh, people who want to go in this field, who might be at a different school in a different state. Uh, so I hope you guys have learned as much as I have learned uh, from these great, smart, powerful uh, women. And uh, we thank you so much for being here.